Welcome to Authentic Living with Roxanne, a place where we have conscious conversations about things that really matter in our lives. And now, here's your host, Roxanne Derhage. everyone, it's uh, Roxanne Durhaj. Thanks for coming in again this week for Authentic Living with Roxanne. Uh, today I have a special young man um, that uh, we are privileged to spend um, some time in a speaker's bureau based out in New York City where he lives. Um, so Ezra, uh, thanks for coming in today to kind of chat with us about um, your, your subject expertise, which is rituals. Thanks so much for having me. It's, it's an honor to be here and it's an honor to still be considered a young man. <laughs> well, you look very young. <laughs> <laughs> it's all the rituals that I do. They keep me youthful. Oh, see, you know? <laughs> I heard today th- there, Ezra, <laughs> to turn back uh, the uh, clock, uh, the hands of time. So tell, tell everybody a little bit about kind of what you do, because I think a ritualist is something, um, and I don't know if I'm using the right um, title, is something uh, that I've not heard much about, um, other than I know a lot about rituals um, as a psychotherapist. But uh, tell me a little bit about the title and kind of your path to kind of getting to the point where you keynote speak, train and and coach about uh, rituals. Sure, yeah. Um, So, Ritualist is the name of my creative studio, which specializes in the design of ritual and primarily secular ritual. And um, so I consider myself a professional ritual designer, which is admittedly a a fairly rare title and job in the world. Um, But the truth of the matter is I'm really trying to bring into the world um, awareness that, you know, rituals are everywhere in our lives and they have been for all of human history. And we are constantly creating new ones. And the only question and, and living into old ones. And the only question is, you know, whether or not they are good and effective and bringing the mentality of an artist, of a designer, um, of a coach into that space to really level up the design of rituals and make sure that they're as effective as they as they can be. Okay, so tell me, I'm curious, like what, um, what got you involved in this kind of work? Did you go to school? Um, is there a ritual school that you go to? <laughs> or what what uh, kind of got you on the path I mean, and I think there's really a lot of significance to rituals. And, you know, we probably don't realize as a society how much we have them kind of um, embedded in a lot of things that we do. But tell me a little bit about how you kind of found yourself kind of in this. I'm going to think I'm going to say a thin edge of a wedge in reference to a, a niche market. Sure. Um, yeah, you know, there, there isn't a ritual design school yet. Hopefully there will be uh, pretty soon if my work continues to be successful. Um, you know, it's, it's incredible to me that even in, you know, theological seminaries, they, they sometimes don't even have classes on, on ritual design. So even in the spaces that we expect there to be, this is a subject that really gets um, let, uh, you know, left off the table. Um, my background is originally in theater. Um, I went to um, SMU in Dallas. I got a, a degree in, in really theater studies and performance art and focusing a lot on the intersection of arts and spirituality and looking at all of our artistic practices as having their roots as ritual and spiritual practices, whether it's, you know, dance or um, storytelling, mask and costuming, uh, you know, all these things had their roots originally as rituals and looking to see if we could reignite those uh, artistic practices to be spiritually transformative, both for the performer and for the audience. And that set me off on a whole circuitous path. Uh, I eventually uh, became the artistic director at this experimental, God-optional, everybody-friendly pop-up Jewish community in New York called Lab Shul, where I was just constantly designing new rituals from scratch um, all the time, trying to reimagine ancient traditions for a modern world. And, And there I got to really sharpen my understanding of the design, like the intricacies of, of really a question that continues to 
to inspire my work, which is why are some rituals better than others, right? Why are some, why do some transform our lives and some are like rote, repetitious, boring, you know, eyes bleeding, can't wait to get out of. Um, what are the experiential conditions around that? Um, and I sharpened my understanding. I learned from some incredible teachers and uh, eventually left to start Ritualist. So let's, let's, let's even back up before we get into it, because the assumption is that a lot of people understand how we define a ritual. Um, so let's go really, really basic. And for in your own words, tell me what a ritual is and maybe give me some basic examples of maybe day-to-day rituals or even rituals that are around us that we may not even stop to realize, wow, that's a ritual. Sure. Yeah. My my colleague Charles Vogel says, you know, you know it's a ritual if you take it away and the moment feels less important. Uh, I really like the simplicity of that, uh, that rituals are these tools that we have for elevating the importance or impact or meaning of life and the things that we do. Uh, I can get really geeky, to be honest, about rituals and definitions. I collect ritual definitions as like a little hobby. Um, and in some ways, they're all right. You know, the, we, can, we can get really intricate into, the, uh, into that definition. Um, but in the end, uh, I, I would just say, look at the things in your life that uh, deepen meaning that elevate something as, as really impactful or important or special. And um, chances are you're, you're looking at a ritual. Uh, mm-hmm. You know, one of the examples that I love to give is the cancer-free golden bell that is often used in children's hospitals. Uh, and I, I have this lovely video, maybe we'll include it in the show notes or something of this individual, Matt, he's 19 years old. Um, he spent most of high school in um, cancer treatment for leukemia. And they have this video of him, you know, coming around the, the, the hallway and there's this, uh, you know, white sheet of paper that two nor- nurses are holding up and he busts through the, the piece of paper and, and you start following down the hall and you see the hall is lined with all of his friends and family and they've got noisemakers and bells and they're clapping and cheering. And he walks down to the end of the hallway and there's this golden bell and he rings it, you know, with all of the love and energy in his heart. And he walks back through this, you know, channel of, of love that surrounds him and he falls into his parents' arms and they hug him and he's crying and they're crying. And usually I'm crying because I'm watching the video. And, um, and in interviews afterwards, they, you know, he says that this is the most important, this is the most important day of his life. And I think it's worth reflecting on, you know, what does this sheet of paper and a golden bell that ultimately are functionally useless. Right? They, they, they don't help him heal. They're, they're not the, 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 you know, the incredible life-saving drugs that he received. And yet that day, that moment is so significant and important. So what do those symbolic actions and symbolic objects do that all that other stuff that he received over the last three years can't? And, um, and, and that's why I love ritual because they're so powerful. And, and they're all around us. Absolutely. And, you know, they are inherently kind of in a lot of things that we do. Like we think of graduations, right? Like, I mean, from, from kindergarten kind of, or, you know, we start little children understanding them, um, you know, because it becomes kind of the thing that, you know, they expect it, you know, and to miss one of those now that just the thought of that, like I have a 21 year old son and, um, you know, every time he, you know, graduated with something, it's a big deal, right? It's like, mm-hmm. you know, you worked hard, like you said, that golden bell I've never heard of. So that's actually, that's fascinating. I had a chill, had a chill go down my spine when you're talking about it, because it just sounds so oh, lovely, like, like what, almost like a cocoon space for him. And, you know, every people, like everybody that's loved him, but then to really go through that space and walk down that hall, it's almost like, um, you know, my sense of what you're saying, it's almost like you could, it's like osmosis. You're going to feel a, like a deep, deep level of love from everybody that's maybe seen him through that, um, his treatment, and then ultimately kind of going to his parents, like what, what, a, what a lovely, lovely kind of space to be in. Um, you know, so it's, it's, so when we think about, so you said, in theater, which I'd never thought about this because I'm not a, you know, um, I don't have any background at all um, in, in arts that way. 
obviously we, you and I keynote, that's a different kind of, maybe, I'm going to say it's a different because I've never done any actual um, kind of artistic um, development that way other than for business and speaking. But what is it about arts and rituals that maybe the average person needs to understand? Uh, yeah, it's a great question. I mean, are you thinking about uh, like, what about the intersection of arts and ritual do people need to understand or? Because I'm thinking, you know, you know, when I'm before I go on stage, I, I you know, I, I ask the energy to give me a good space to for, be able to clear my path. So, I, you know, what is in my heart gets shared with the audience and to make it so that we connect at a profound level. Um, and I, I'm very, and I, I'll thank, you know, the energy of the universe for allowing me to be in the space that I'm at. And then I go on stage. So um, tell me about that intersectionality between the arts and rituals, because I'm, I'm, again, curiosity for me. And I'm, I'm thinking if I'm potentially curious, potentially people listening might be as well. Yeah, sure. Um, I think it's, it's fascinating the way that it's really only in modern history that these two practices got separated out uh, and that there was this notion that there was, you know, art as separate from ritual. I think for me, it's an ongoing question. I think a lot about beauty making in the world and um, the ways in which, you know, creating something as beautiful is often functionally useless. And I, you know, going back to that, that same example um, or, or even a graduation ceremony, right? Like functionally I've graduated, whether I go to that ceremony or not, and so what's happening in those spaces uh, that, that we crave and love and, and yearn for so much. And, and, you know, to your point that we saw in the pandemic, you know, a lot of people thought graduation was boring. They, you know, they, they, they were, you know, rolled their eyes during it. They were on their phones, you know, and then all of a sudden it got taken away from them and they realized that this like massive hole was missing in their lives. So, I think that the the interesting question here is around um, symbolism and rituals containing some kind of symbolic action, uh, which you know uh, Christine Lagari talks about as as causally opaque or directly lacking some sort of instrumental purpose. So if I work out in the morning, um, it's serving the exact purpose. You know, if I go for a run, it's doing that. I'm going for a run. It's you know, it's 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 the exercise that I need in my life. Um, but if I like similar to your ritual that you just described, if I, uh, stopped after my run and put my hands on my body and looked in the mirror and took a few breaths and filled myself up with gratitude for having a body and I, and I get to run and what a privilege that is. And then I smile at myself rather than, you know, when we like finish a run and we're like, Oh, I wish I did more. I wish I could have done this. My body sucked. But if we just lifted ourselves up with some gratitude, um, now we've, we've, interwoven some ritual into that uh, routine or that habit. And so that ritual, looking at the mirror doesn't help me run any faster, but it, it works on my psychology. It works on my emotions. Um, it works on these invisible spaces that uh, that ritual allows to be visible and tangible. And I think art is similar in that way. It, it can take abstract, invisible concepts. It can play in that realm of emotional experience. It often brings people together into collective space to have collective experiences around, um, you know, a, a singular concept and, and ritual does the same for us. Right, right. So <clears throat> let's talk a little bit about when you're coaching one-to-one, -one. Um, you know, we, of course, in, in a lot of, you know, business books are out there about rituals, right? What, when you work with someone, is this part of the work that you do with people or is it that people come to you just to focus on rituals to enhance, say, a particular area of their life? Hmm. Yeah, a, a lot of, you know, all of the above. Uh, sometimes people come with a, like an acute need that there's, and it's often around change or transition. I'm, I'm exiting a job. I'm starting a new job. Uh, I just, you know, my boss got fired and I'm taking over and there's a lot of instability and there's been layoffs, you know. So it's often in these moments of change, transition, uh, or change as well, uh, instability, anxiety, loss, 
that they're coming for an acute need of, uh, can you help us transition through this change through ritual? You know, changes happen to us. Transitions are the conscious psychological you know, uh, decisions that we, that we make to come to terms with change. And rituals are the ways in which we can embody transitions and bring them out into shared experience. Um, so repeat that again, because I, I love that because I don't think I've ever could it enunciate it that way. So we're going through a flux or a change. Um, transitions are what we do and rituals are the, I'm going to use the word technique that may be wrong, um, that gets created to help us through that, those transitions. So I would amend that a little bit. What I, what I like to say, and this is based on some, some research in psychology, that changes um, are external. They happen to us. They're, they're out of our control, right? Um, the, uh, for example, you know, the, the CEO is stepping down. It's just happening to us. We don't really have a choice in the matter. Transitions, it's an inner process. It's a psychological process. It's a thought process and sometimes an emotional process, um, often happening in the background, but, but at its best, it's happening very consciously where we're making conscious, intentional choices and thought processes to come to terms with what does this change mean to us? How are we interpreting it? How are we, how are we metabolizing it into our lives? How are we coming to understand it? And then rituals are these outward actions that bring those inner psychological transition thoughts into lived experience, into an embodied experience, and often with others. So for a, a great example in the, in the world of business is Zipcar, um, maybe a decade ago or so, was going through um, this major org change where they were shifting away from desktop towards mobile. And it was a, it was in the early days where that this was seen as potentially uh, fraught. You know, this is not a a, a guaranteed business decision. Some people are going to get laid off. There was going to be you know moves in the org, a lot of uncertainty. And they held this ritual where they brought everyone together into their main space, and they had a couple of desktop computers, and they took turns in this ceremony of of literally smashing the old ways, smashing those computers, and giving this like cathartic release. To the, to the company and they had a whole party around it. So to take this moment of anxiety about the unknown and inject some hope, because that is also can be the unknown can be hope. And all that loss of the old ways can also be liberation. So they made a, a more complete circle of what that change could be. And it gave uh, employees an opportunity to express how they were feeling um, authentically rather than just suppress it and, uh, and keep it to themselves. And so that was the ritual. That was the, that was the ritual. The bashing so that they could, um, make sense with a physical action based on something that internally they're, they're going through, you know, which is to go from kind of a, you know, a desktop to, to mobile. Now let's, I'm curious again about rituals when sometimes some changes are known and others are not within companies. Does it make a difference when you're tailoring uh, or working through a transition? Um, if it's a merger and acquisition, let's say for instance, Ezra, like that's one thing, right? But let's say um, it's something like, um, it's a positive change, for instance, versus kind of being taken over. Are there different ways that you kind of approach um, those kind of ritualistic development of things to to work with people in, in those different scenarios? Sure. I think the approach is really similar. Um, yeah, there's all kinds of positive changes as well. Onboarding a new employee, right, is a great, um, or if you're a coach, onboarding a new client, what's that first session like? Um, how do you bring them in? Is it just an email welcome and here's the PDF and here's my Zoom link? Or is there something that you do to slow down, to zoom in on, on what's really happening and possibly zoom out and connect to something larger, bigger than themselves? So that's what ritual provides. It provides that opportunity to, to um, embody a, and, and connect to a purpose because we are so on autopilot all the time. We are moving so quickly through life. The, the whole sort of a world and economy is structured to just keep us distracted. And rituals are these, uh, you know, 
I would say, interventions or interruptions that help us slow down and become conscious to what we're doing, right? Like uh, when I'm starting a new client relationship um, and a new coaching relationship, that's significant. It, it's intimate. It's vulnerable. That's where I'm going with my clients. Um, there's exchange. There's value. There's money. They're taking risk. All that is there. It's under the surface. Are we going to make it visible? Are we going to express it? Or is it just going to um, sort of fall into the background? And by the way, continue to affect us, right? Like it's, it, it's there, it's in the subconscious, it's in the, uh, you know, it's, it's in, our, sh it's in the, our collective unconscious, it's right there, um, but it's just unexpressed. So yeah, so I, I deal as well with the positive kinds of rituals as well, that the ones that we're looking forward to. Um, the only thing I would say is that any change, even the ones that we love, even the ones that we're excited about come with loss and anxiety, loss from the past and anxiety about the future. A marriage is a great example, right? On our wedding day, there is grief inside of a wedding. There is loss inside of a wedding and there is anxiety. There is unknown. Um, it's not the full picture, but it's also there. Mm -hmm. and, and of course, yes, and that's a, such a generally a very positive thing. But then I remember when I got married, I thought it was like, oh my God, like this is it, right? Like you're like going through it. And then you're like, oh my goodness. So then, which is what you're speaking to, even though it's a positive, great thing, there is a loss associated with from, you know, going from being single to then being in, in a, um, you know, in a relationship, you know, and generally I would say most people when they take their vows, it's, it's forever. And that's a, a, a scary thought as well too, as you, you know, starting off things. So when companies, <clears throat> When companies, how might they come to you? Um, in, in what context? Are they coming to you in crises? Are they coming because their data in reference to, you know, um, health and wellness, there's some issues. Is it that, hey, Ezra, that ritual thing sounds like a good thing. We'll do a lunch and learn on it. Like, how is it, or is it like a part of, the work based on a bigger context? Are they coming to you for around change management? Yeah, sure. So, you know, I, I, I work in a lot of different contexts. So sometimes it looks like, uh, you know, one-off workshop or keynote um, and maybe a, a small little design sprint. Sometimes it's a, it's a more sustained kind of, like you said, lunch and learn process. Um, sometimes it's, it's deeper, longer engagements that are really looking at culture change from a more systemic perspective. And sometimes it's actually like design uh, work as well. I, I worked with um, this company called uh, ephemeral tattoos that designed a, an ink that fades after a year. So same tattoo process, but it fades after a year. And they, they came to me before they launched with a question of you know, how do we make this process a meaningful experience for our customers if it's not forever? How is it meaningful, impactful in their lives if it's not forever? And so we looked at this concept of ephemerality, of change, uh, and the, the, the wider context in the world of how do we celebrate the fact that we are constantly changing and that nothing is forever? And how do we embrace that uh, in the context of our interaction with this, with this company? So, and that looked like uh, experience design, service design, even um, the design of the studio itself. So again, I, I work in a lot of different contexts. Um, I think that uh, I think that often the question with companies is around culture change and the recognition that the uh, how we relate to one another um, and this very human element of what it means to come together for a singular vision at an organization or a company um, and these questions of um, how is, how can my work be meaningful? How can my work connect to my, my purpose in life? How do I find real belonging with my, um, fellow employees at work? Um, most companies are, are really terribly equipped to answer those questions, but they're being asked them by their employees. And so they come to me and, and it looks a lot like culture work and, and it looks a lot like creating embodied experiences around values, you know, what does this company, what does this organization value at its most? What are its highest, deepest aspirations and values? And how do we create shared experiences that lift those up as important? 
Not and just that's... so they don't just get emailed to you, you know, as a PDF when you get onboarded and then you never talk th about them again, but they're actually embodied in behaviors that are noticeable and are lifted up in moments where we can see, oh, these, these matter, right? We're taking time around them and I can see them, I can feel them. And, and now I know what it really means like to work at this organization. So not the onboarding, here's my mission, my vision, my values based on the inception of the company, but also onboarding people from the space where you say, you know, you're bringing your uniqueness and how are you going to embody that uniqueness, but also understanding maybe what the original intent of the company was. But to, so it's a shared experience then you're saying with, with a new person coming in and, and then kind of figuring out what value they're going to bring and finding a, a different space for them to be able to thrive in that environment then. Yeah, it can look like that for sure. Oh. Um, it can, and it can look a lot like, um, you know, I mean, hopefully it's a, it's a, the process is so embedded into the culture and DNA of the company that, you know, by the time you're entering, by the time you're getting onboarded, right, all your interview process and what you know and what you've heard about this company, you've, you've already self-selected into that place because you are, you know, their culture is so discernible um, and so recognizable and what they stand for and what their values are so discernible and recognizable. Um, that's when you know that the rituals are really effective. So what you're saying is that you are working with company then in recruiting is that, do you start as far back? Like, I mean, that primary, because so you're talking about, okay, overall macro culture, right? Like they, they you know, this is, you know, let's say it's like you say, um, you know, uh, invisible tattoos. Obviously somebody came up with a night, generally tattoos are like, oh my goodness, you know, I'm going to have a tattoo and I, you know, <laughs> hopefully I don't regret this in 30 years. That's generally the concept, this, which is a fascinating concept of it being gone in a year, but then there's also loss to the fact, what if I really like this darn thing, right? And I, I, then in a year, I'm second guessing that I, I want to, you know, keep it, but now it's going to be gone kind of thing. So, so when, um, what you're saying is on the, on the primary end of somebody being onboarded, when you've worked with companies, then you're working with them, even in the selection and screening process, at the, at the begin the very, very top beginning end of this employee experience, all the way into um, getting them accustomed to what the culture would be like by the time they get onboarded. Um, yeah, it, it can, it can be right. Um, it can certain, it certainly can look like that as well. Mm -hmm. So let's say, you know, the leaders and, or maybe the CEOs that are listening to it and they're thinking, Hmm, this sounds interesting. Ezra, why might I consider rituals? Like I'm having some difficult, well, no different than anybody else. And we got the quiet quitting and, you know, I've got all that other stuff going on and there's massive change, you know, post pandemic, all that kind of stuff. There's some morale issues. Why might I consider a concept of what you're suggesting? What would be the benefits? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, great question. Thanks for asking it. Come to my website, email me. I'd love to talk to you more about it. If you're thinking that, I'd love to talk to you more about it. Uh, Ezra at ritualist.life. I'll make the plug right now. Um, you know, I think Reed, Reed Hoffman says it, says it best. Um, he says, you know, the right rituals in the right place will help you build your culture, cohere your team and achieve your goals. Mm -hmm. But if you aren't intentional about the rituals you create, you may find that rituals spring up on their own that hold you back. So, you know, what I would say to that person, um, you know, CEO, I would say, look, um, you already have rituals at your company because you have a culture. It might not be very well defined, um, but you do have a culture and you already have rituals that embody the values of that culture. They just might not be very good rituals. Um, and that might look like they're not effective at embodying the values that you sincerely hold and that you want. You know, you, you're such a human centered leader and you really want them to know that you care, but like your rituals aren't actually communicating that or even worse, right? Is that your rituals are actually uh, working against your values. They're communicating something totally different. And so uh, if you're wondering that, uh, you know, uh, the, the, the question that you just have to ask yourself is, is, 
not do I need or do I want rituals at my workplace? It's do I want good, effective rituals that work for me and my, and my vision? Um, because, you know, what I, would re- what I would lovingly and, and with a smile remind people is that rituals have been uh, used in every single culture in the world, in every place throughout human history from the beginning of time. Right? We have evidence of rituals from our earliest ancestors. Um, at the, at the beginning of the hunt, right? Um, and so for something that powerful and that core to human consciousness and behavior, how, how could you possibly leave it out of the conversation? This was such a great interview that we decided to turn it into a two-part series. Be sure to tune in next week for part two so you don't miss out on the amazing content. Thanks for tuning in to Authentic Living with Roxanne, creating the space for positive, healthy change. Roxanne is a keynote speaker, psychotherapist, and coach. To work with Roxanne, visit roxanderhajcom slash blueprint. We'll see you next time on Authentic Living with Roxanne.